today. My name is Rich. I am an ordinand in the Church of England. That means I am going to be ordained in a year. I'm married to Louisa, who sat here, and um, we have a little boy called Johannes. Let me just start my timer. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we are continuing our series on. We are continuing our series on. On the reason for God and conversations on faith and life. Uh, you can tweet, I think that's up there. Yes, tweet if you are on Twitter. If you are on Twitter and you want to follow me, I'm always up for new followers. So, Rich V. Grant, and you can follow me. Um, but also, you can text. So, do text in your questions, and we will be having our panel. So, this week is What About Hell? I have to be honest with you. Um, I approach that subject with a certain amount of trepidation. I think it's brave to, to look into hell and to think about what it is. In fact, I think hell's a little bit like the awkward relative that you have in your family. You know, when I was dating Louisa, I was very careful about who I introduced her to before we were married. And I think um, hell's kind of got that reputation now amongst us, that it's, this, it's there, we all know it's there, much like the relative, but we're careful about when we talk about it, or him or her, and, and who we introduce it to. Hell kind of exists in the closet of the Christian faith, and we know it's there, and we know it's important, but we've put it away because we're scared of what the visitors will think. And yet today we're going to look at it, and we're going to look at why it's important for us to think about hell, what it tells us and what it shows us about God and Jesus, and all those things that come with that. So with that in mind, let me pray for us. Father, we come before you as your children. We listen to your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would come now, that as we study the word, that we would meet the risen Jesus, and that you would glorify your name, and your kingdom would come. Everyone said, Amen. A few years ago, I had the experience within 12 months of sitting in two different hospital rooms and watching two members of my family die. The first we sat and we watched as she passed from life to death. And she was a Christian. And it was an amazing sense of peace. Her death was untimely. And yet there was hope. There was this sense in which this wasn't actually the end, that there was more. And even though we mourned and we grieved like any family would, you, you still had this sense of hope. Ten months after that, I sat in a different hospital room with a different member of my family who wasn't a Christian. In fact, um, his only declaration of faith throughout his whole life was, I'm an atheist. And again, we sat and we watched as life slipped away and death came. I was struck as we left that hospital room that we left that room with questions For those of us of faith, that's where our faith hits the road. Where what we believe starts to really matter. And I was was struck by how as we left that hospital room, and we left that person in some senses behind, we left hanging in the air questions. Where are they now? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for them? What does this say about God? Today I want to look at three questions. First of all, I want to ask, what is hell? And what do we mean when we talk about hell? Then I want to say, how does that fit with the idea of a God of justice? And can that God also be considered living? Jesus speaks in parables. He's talk to his disciples, he's addressed his disciples, and then we come to this passage in Luke, and he starts to tell another story, another parable. It's important that when we listen to this, we realize that Jesus is using an illustration. It's not less true, but it's still, it's a story. And he says there's a rich man, and all his life he's been wealthy. He's had it all. He's lived the dream. He has purple linen and fine clothes. And by his door sits a poor man, so poor that the dogs lick his wounds. Even in our culture, to have a dog lick your wounds is 
fairly bad, I, I imagine. But in that culture, it's so bad. Here we have this contrast. And Jesus tells this story, doesn't he? And he says, what happens is, is the rich man dies and so does Lazarus. Incidentally, the only person named in all of Jesus' parables is Lazarus. The only character in a parable Jesus tells that gets a name is the poor man whose wounds are licked. Anyway, they die and they go to Hades, which is one understanding for hell. And this conversation ensues between the rich man in hell and Abraham. And he's saying, I know, I'm in agony, I'm in fire, this is awful. Send Lazarus, send Lazarus to help me. And Abraham starts to explain how that really can't happen and, and, and has this conversation with him. And at the end of it, we're left with Lazarus still in, fire and, uh, still in heaven and the rich man still in hell. For me, I, my fear of talking of hell is often that we've reduced it to this idea of fire that's almost juvenile. Sometimes when I think about hell, I think we imagine a muscular God. For some reason, God always gets muscles at that point. I know if you've ever seen a cartoon, but God mostly doesn't have muscles, except when he's sending people to hell. And then suddenly, God's ripped. And he's like, hey, get to hell. And our picture of God is him kind of sending people to hell. And people, as they're falling away, crying out, God, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And yet, muscly God stands on the top and says, no, you're going to hell. That's often the picture of hell, certainly the picture of hell that is portrayed in our world. But often I think it's a picture of hell most of the church believes too, or at least has some kind of understanding of. And yet that's not the picture Jesus paints here. Think about this rich man. He's not in hell saying, I'm sorry, let me out. He's surprisingly blind to his own situation. He doesn't want to come out of hell, out of Hades. He actually wants Lazarus to come down and give him some water. He wants to bring Lazarus into his situation. Not only is he blind, but he's in denial. Send Lazarus. He's still living as though he was the rich man and Lazarus was the beggar at his gate. He's still living in that reality. Send Lazarus to serve me again. Nothing's changed in his heart. The fundamental posture of his heart, which was to ignore Lazarus every single day, is still there. Lazarus should be sent back to earth to tell his brothers. You know, Lazarus was poor on earth. And the rich man's saying, send him away from his comfort in heaven, back down there so he can warm my family for me. Nothing's changed in his heart. He's not repenting. He's not saying, I'm so sorry, let me out. And he's blaming. He shifts the blame. Later on he says, you know, go and warn them. Why do you want to warn someone? Well, they need warning because we don't have enough information. That's the implied thing the rich man's saying. I didn't have enough information. How was I to know? You see, what's happened here is the fire is a metaphor for something far worse than fire. What's happened in the rich man's life as he's passed from life to death is the fire has burned away everything except that which he built his life upon. And the thing his identity is built upon is his wealth is his position of power, is his status. Hell is being defined here as a life centered on something other than God. It's been defined here as a life away from God. What would that life look like? Well, in, Lazarus, in the rich man's case, it means ignoring the poor. It's saying no to God's yes. When God says yes to the world, he says, I want to make this kind of people. I want them to live in this kind of way. I want them to be just and loving and gracious and kind and the things of this kingdom of God. 
And how is when we say no to that? It's an identity built on status. And what happens is the fire of hell disintegrates all that we build our life upon. All the, every, the fire of hell disintegrates everything but that which we build our lives upon. C.S. Lewis says this, There are two kinds of people. There are God-centered people, and there are self-centered people. And ultimately, they're the only two kinds of people in the world. And he says, if you imagine yourself a self-centered person, maybe you grumbling or, or angry or frustrated, 80 years I can become this kind of person. But if I take that self-centeredness into eternity with me, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, you know, infinite numbers of years from now, all that becomes left is that grumble. He says that the person who grumbles in their 80 years, in their self-centered way, in the end, all that's left is a machine that grumbles. I think this picture of hell is not that hard to imagine. If we look in our world today, we do actually see a world that, has, that is self-centered. We see the consequences of that. You know, millions of people without water. Children dying from preventable diseases. War. Poverty in our own nation. What we're seeing there is the, action, the consequences of lives built on the, ourselves. Imagine that into eternity, but without the hope of Jesus. That's the picture of hell that we're given here. For me, that's far worse than fire. It's a far more frightening reality. Tim Keller says this, all that are in hell choose it. They choose to say no to God's yes. He says, all God does with people in the end is give them what they want, including freedom from himself. That's hell. Freedom from God. So much freedom from God that his, the things he brings us, the yes he says to us, no longer exists. Well, that's the bad news. And it, it is bad news. But the good news, the good news is Jesus. The good news is Jesus. And I want to look now at how Jesus can rescue us from that hell. How Jesus is the answer to that question. If that's hell, then I want to look now at how Jesus shows us both justice and love. One of the most common objections to the idea of hell is that hell shows an angry God who just simply judges. You know, it's that picture again of the muscular God sending people off to hell. One of the most common objections to the idea of hell is that. It's like, isn't it God just being angry right now? Isn't God just being angry? Isn't he just being an angry judge? Well, I want to argue that hell actually makes God more just. And I want to argue it in this way. First of all, hell makes more God, God more just because God allows us to choose. God doesn't force us to follow him. He allows us to choose. If we want to choose a life away from him, he's so just that he won't force you to worship him. He doesn't force a rich man to worship him. He lets us choose. But I also want to say that this, that a judging God is good news for us. Hell helps us see the justice because it says this, God will put wrong right. It says that God looks at our world and some things he says no to. Some situations he says are not of my kingdom. Some things he says, no, that's not the world I created. Jesus confronts injustice all the time. Jesus confronts self-centered sin all the time. We actually need a God who judges. We actually need a God who says, no, that's not right. For God to make sense, for God to be God, to God for God to be worthy of worship... It has to be the case that he says no to injustice.
But Jesus doesn't just say no to it. He also presents an alternative. You know, we read the Gospels. He presents an alternative kingdom. The, the Sermon on the Mount, for example. See, what Jesus does is this. He says, on behalf of God, as God, he says, I created this kind of world. And I'm saying no to the self-centered world that's been created. And I'm saying yes to my kingdom. And so we need a God who judges. We need it internationally, globally. I need to know that in the end, God's going to put everything right. That's the promise of the Christian faith, that there's going to be a better day, another day. But I need it personally as well. I need to know personally that God is just. One, I need to know it for those relatives of mine who don't know Jesus. Because I want to know that in the end, the, question, the answer to the question of what happens to them is this. God is just. And not human justice that leaves us still thirsting for more, but godly justice that leaves us satisfied. But I also need to be able to live my life. You know, one of the things I've been thinking on recently is how do I move on from past hurts? How do I forgive people? How do I live tomorrow knowing that all these things have happened in my life? Knowing that God will judge between right and wrong enables us to have freedom in that way. We don't have to be judged. We can be released from that. We can acknowledge wrong and we can forgive, knowing that God was for those people. That's been immensely freeing for me. To be able to look back on my teenage years where some, some stuff, awful stuff happened, and to be able to say, God will judge that. That was wrong, and God will judge it. And therefore, it has no hold on me, because God is just. And you know, ultimately, the cross is where Christ judges the world. The cross is about love, and we'll come to that, but it's also a judgment. When Christ dies on the cross, God is saying, I find this world guilty. That's God saying, I find this world guilty. That what you've done with it, I'm saying no to. So, we need a God who is a judge. Because we long for justice. Every time we've cried no when we've watched the news. Every time we've cried no when someone's wronged us. We're really crying out for a God of justice. That's what we see. Hell helps us understand that. Because hell says, hell's what happens when we say no to God. But this God is not just a just God. And he's not only a judging God, he's a loving God. And justice and love go together. And they go together like this. First of all, it helps us understand just how loving God is when we start to think about hell. Because for Jesus to rescue us, he has to rescue us from something. And the thing he rescues us is from hell. He rescues us from a life centered on ourselves. When he judges the world on the cross, he also forgives it. In that one moment, as he stretches out his arms, as he gives in and surrenders, he both judges the world, but he also shows how much he loves it. Think about our story. At the end, Abraham, Father Abraham says to him, Son, it's interesting that he uses the word son, not you awful sinner. He says, son, go, even if I sent Lazarus back to tell your brothers, they wouldn't believe him. He says, look, at, they need to study Moses and the prophets. Why does he say that? Well, Moses and the prophets tell us the story of what's happened. And it tells a story of humanity who's walked away from God over and over and over again. And what happens is when we grasp that, when we grasp our own walking away from God, our own turning away from, from our Father, our own walking away from the covenant he's made with us, our own denying of our identity centered on him, 
When we see that, we begin to see the cross in a different way. We begin to see the extent to which God loves us. You see, on the cross, Christ judges the world, but he loves it too. He says yes to his people in that moment. He says no to his world, but yes to his people. And it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus cries out from the cross, I am thirsty. What does Lazarus say in Hades? He says, I'm thirsty. What does Jesus cry out from the cross? I'm thirsty. What is hell? Hell is separation from one another. Hell is an eternity with just me and my sin. What does Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, in that moment, Christ takes upon himself all that we deserve. He says, I am thirsty, and he suffers our thirst. He says, why have you forsaken me? And he suffers our forsakenness. But it's good news because he says, it is finished. And what he does is he speaks over our self-centered identity. He speaks over hell as an option for us. And he says, all those who trust in me can say of hell this, it is finished. The invitation of Jesus is this, that we don't center our identity on ourselves, but on him and what he can do and what he has done, that we would be judged by him and found worthy of hell and yet loved by him, and so set free from hell. That our identity would become so centered on him. So centered on him. And finally, the invitation is this, that when we look into hell, that when we look into hell, we see a cross as believers in Jesus. We see not hell but a cross. And that cross says to us, you are forgiven. And you are loved. I want to finish with a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, In the end, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe away sin at all costs? Give them a fresh start? He did on Calvary to forgive them. But they don't ask to be forgiven. To leave them alone. Well, that's what hell is. We have a lot of questions on the panel. Rich, thank you for that. That was uh, powerful stuff. Rupert uh, has come to bring us his uh, particular theological expertise. Uh, so I'll make sure you get some tough questions. Um, can we have our first question up? Okay. Isn't hell, this is a question about uh, language and uh, metaphor, isn't hell actually physically a lake of fire and sulfur as is stated in Revelation? Well, you've got the microphone, Rupert. Why don't you start with that? <laughs> the great advantage of uh, the first question is you don't have to take other ones. Um, well... I guess the answer is we don't, I guess the answer is I don't know. I was going to say we don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody does. Uh, I don't know. Um, so if, I, if I'm answering the question, um, then I would pick up on, 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 on Rich's introductory point, which is there are, there are all sorts of strong pictures in the Bible, um, whether they are completely real or whether they are indicators of, of something other. How, how can we really know the answer to that question? But if they are indicators, they're certainly indicators of something that we do not want to be touching, to be connected to, to experience uh, in, in any way. And when we were sitting in our little group just now, thinking about touching on that, it's, you know, is this a physical experience or a, or a metaphorical, spiritual experience? Well, whatever kind of experience it is, Jesus was very adamant that this was something that we needed to hear a warning about. So uh, I guess that's the, that's the real issue for me, that this is, this is something that is very sobering, uh, whatever kind of experience it is. 
Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it could be real, couldn't it? I mean, I, I would say that um, it's something beyond our imagination. So we talk about heaven being paved with you know, streets of gold. Well, I don't expect heaven to be streets of gold, but I do expect it to be something beyond my imagination. And, and that, that stretches my imagination to think of a place like that. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm not expecting there to be a big house with lots of rooms. In my father's house, there's many rooms. I'm not expecting to go to a house, a big house with lots of rooms. But it stretches my imagination as to what heaven might be like. And I think similarly, this imagery, it stretches my imagination as what, what hell might be like. But I would, I would want to say that it could, you know, it could be. Uh, but I would also want to say that for me, personally, I find the... Um, I find the I find it much much um, scarier in some ways, or, or much worse. This idea of separation and of of torment, of kind of being left with all my sin, as a much more both frightening and realistic picture. Thank you. Um, next question. <laughs> Is an eternal hell? just. So Rich, you were talking a lot about uh, how God can be both just and loving, uh, and that um, when we cry out no, when we watch the news, we are calling out for a just God. Um, How does ongoing eternal punishment, uh, obviously when we punish criminals, they have sentences that come to an end, uh, and they've served their time. Uh, How does that work if hell is eternal? Good question. Um, I mean, I, let, let's, I'll just be honest. With you. I, I do struggle with that. I, and, but I would say that um, having thought lots about it, the interesting thing is, is I think we often think of hell as this place where people are screaming out, God, why did you? I'm so sorry. Is it too late? You know, is, is it really too late for me? I mean, and yet I think hell's actually not people screaming out, is it too late for me? But actually people who are angry at God. And, and who are saying, you know, C.S. Lewis writes an amazing book called The Great Divorce, which you should all read. It's, it's a fascinating little book. And he says that for, for those in hell, heaven is a sham. You know, it's not, a, it's not something that could possibly be true. That, and, and I would say that for those in hell, um, and the, that the idea of heaven is not, it's just, it's, it's almost a sham to them. So they're not crying out, God, save me. They're just kind of like, well, if you read a C.S. Lewis book, he says that even the grass of heaven would cut their feet. They've so far now from what God is. And I think that um, that's a quite a help for me. That's been a really helpful way of thinking about that question. And I guess one of my questions, one of my questions back would be, do we want to, re- we don't, aren't keen on letting people out of prison who, who aren't actually repentant? You know, and if we could, you know, if, if we could keep people in prison who were like this, keep keep committing crimes we would do that and i think with hell i think they're not i would say people in hell are not are not screaming out god save me but are really they're what darren will says they're shaking their fists at god and i i find that really helpful imagery but it's a really tough question i should stop um yeah i definitely echo that book the great divorce if if you find in the tiredness of life reading christian theology difficult The Great Divorce is a brilliant book because it's basically an allegory. It's a story. It's also a really short story. Um, So you've read a Christian classic by a leading Christian theologian and author, and it won't take you long, and you'll enjoy it, uh, even though it is sobering. It has humorous elements to it, and it's basically a bus trip from hell to heaven, and there's a bunch of people who are are invited to sample heaven from hell, and then what's their response, which is largely righteous indignation that they should ever have been uh, in hell. The people in heaven are all pious and self-righteous and uh, they're the real authentic people. And, and most of them in the end say that hell, as Rich said, hell, heaven is a sham and you know, they're the true truthful people uh, and they're happy where they are. Um, that's a bad rendition of the story, it's re- but it is a, a, great, a great book and one of, I would say one of, the best Christi- one of the most helpful Christian books I've read. My, my response to the question, everybody, I think, Nobody can be a Christian for long and not ask that question. You know, is, is eternal judgment fair? You know, it, does it exist? Is it fair? Um, uh, who wouldn't struggle over something like that? Um, and and my, my other response is, I guess, 
in my personal experience, it is the doctrines from the Bible that we really can't square the circle of that are the ones that probably God uses to help hone us and change us and pull us closer to him, even if we don't really understand how. Because it requires a humility on our behalf and a submission to say, Lord, uh, I don't understand. Help me understand. You know, I believe, but help me believe. Um, so I would say, I don't really know how it works, but that my understanding is that the scripture is relatively speaking, that that eternal judgment seems to be what it is saying. That's how I understand it. And, and I think it probably is, is helpful for us to struggle with believing it rather than parking it because we can't fully explain it. Thank you. I mean, I think I, think I would add on that. It, you know, it is a, uh, a question that the church has struggled with, I think. Um, and there are a variety of, of views about it. And I think... Uh, there is, it's, it's not in the creed, for example, so it's not something that you have to say, this is what I believe. If, if I don't believe in an eternal conscious hell, then uh, my salvation is in jeopardy. Um, and uh, you know, many would use some of the arguments that Lewis puts forward to, uh, to say, well, actually, God burns away all that is uh, good in that, so not burns away, but uh, kind of uh, be, they, as they become increasingly selfish, that idea that you know, 80 years of selfishness, you know, become an eternity of selfishness. Actually, you become a machine. Um, you become less than human. Your humanity just gradually disappears. Um, actually, that can become uh, you know a place where existence disappears because apart from God, we don't, we can't exist. Uh, life doesn't exist, and so extinction occurs. So there, there is that view, which I think is a legitimate one within the Christian faith, but I think Rupert's fair in saying that amongst the, the variety of, of pictures, of metaphors that there are in Scripture, some kind of lean towards that sort of extinction or annihilation, if you like. Others seem to talk about something that goes on forever. Um, and, uh, and I think it, you know, there's a ongoing debate uh, throughout the history of the church around the precise nature of hell. But I think the reality of, of judgment and uh, a kind of eternity without, without God is, is, is real and not something not to be kind of, uh, kind of just rejected. Uh, have we got a third question? One more question. I think that's good. And then uh, we can do communion. Ooh. Do you think hell is eternal separation from God as the passage seemed to suggest, a conversation between heaven and hell. Rich, I think you've done the exegesis. Uh, you do? Uh, <laughs> well, that, that's a relief. Um, I think that it's, uh, we should remember this as a parable, and that, um, that not that we take it less seriously, it's, it's the word of God and we believe it, but it's a, it's a parable. And, and by that I mean, you know, Jesus used it to make an illustration of something. And, you know, Jesus is from a storytelling culture, you know, and this is the kind of thing that's happened. Actually, this is a story that's, oh, this, this is a variation of a story that was being told by lots of people at this time to think about these, these questions. And so I think Jesus adopts a story from his time like every good teacher does, and he, he uses it to illustrate a point. I think you'd, you'd be, um, I, I would caution against going, well, this is then exactly how it is, in the sense of literally how it is, because this is a parable. And if you think about the other parables, um, I'm struggling to think of one where I can make this point. Though. Um, but if you read the other parables, you see it, it's a common kind of thing, isn't it? We have parables, you know, we read stories to Johannes about these little wooden creatures. Everyone's heard of them, the Winnicks, Winnicks something like that. Um, and they, they get stars and dots for being good and bad and all kinds of things. Where Johannes, I don't think, will be will distrust us if they don't if there's not actually wooden people. It's the point of the story that's important. That was a poor illustration. I mean, I think that the reality is that you know there are lots of pictures and lots of terms that that we would kind of collectively talk about as hell. So uh, hell is Hades, which was the uh, the kind of Greek uh, realm of the dead. Uh, you have Tartarus. Uh, you have Gehenna, which is the kind of rubbish tip just outside of Jerusalem, which burned forever, uh, where all the refuse was thrown. Um, and I think that the reality is, is that they are all kind of pictures of that eternal separation 
uh, from God. So I think where we try to pin things down um, and, uh, and define too closely, uh, then I think we begin to get into trouble. But I think it's important to say that uh, you know, the surefire way of avoiding hell, whatever the particulars uh, of it are, is to trust in what Jesus uh, has done for us on the cross, because there he faced hell. But the, interestingly, the, the creed itself says he descended into Hades, and you'll see pictures of uh, kind of icons in Orthodox churches where he's in Hades, he's stomped on Satan's head, and he's pulling Adam and Eve back out from death. And, uh, and for me, that's, that's where hell should be. Amen. Uh, amen. Marvelous. Well, why don't, why don't we give these guys a round of applause? Thank you. Very much. <laughs>